Praise God. Well, church, get your Bibles out this morning. Oh, we can do better than that. Come on, we ought to be excited about the Word of God. Get your Bibles out this morning. There we go. Yeah. Tracy, she did great last week when she taught the deal about, you know, you know everybody take a breath and you're not going to run out of air. There's abundance. and then. But I, I'm telling you, she's touching a sacred cow there about not getting any clothes. <laughs> Women can't get new clothes for 40 years, okay? Praise God. Wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole. <laughs> 50% last week, home run. This week, oh. Anyway, you know, praise God. I, I, I just want to wanna share some things with you this morning. And, and uh, you know, I heard a good testimony right before church. The Jacksons told me about a friend of theirs that listens to the radio uh, in Lake Charles, Louisiana. Listens, catches a broadcast, knew who I was. They were trying to get him to come to church and knew who I was. Because he had been listening for five years to the radio broadcast in Lake Charles. I didn't even know it went that far. And so praise God, you know, that's a blessing of all the things going on. Because you got to realize this morning, you're here in church. You're sitting here, but watching over the broadcast, it's going around the world. The, the radio broadcast is going all over Texas. And there's a lot of more people in church than just you this morning. So praise God, you know. So um, I'm talking this morning and, and coming... Just continuing on the message that I started last week about a move of God. Everybody say, I want a move of God. <laughs> you know, you have a move of God in your life the day you got saved. That was the start of the move of God. I, 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 wanna, I cannot emphasize this more. The day that you made Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of your life, the day that you know that you know that you know. See, folks, you cannot live your life by head knowledge. You cannot live your life by religious knowledge. You cannot just live your life by saying, oh, well, I'm a, I belong to denomination. I once asked a person, are you, are, are you a Christian? And they said, you know, oh, I'm a, a, a denomination. And I'm like, no, no, no. I mean, are you a Christian? No, well, I'm a, I'm a denomination. It's like it was two separate things. Like being a Christian was a denomination. Are y'all following me here? Being a Christian means that Jesus Christ is the Lord and Savior of your life. End of story. That's the number one thing that counts. Where you go to church is something completely different. Hello? But you got to know inside of you that Jesus Christ is the Lord and Savior of your life. Now you say, well, how do I know? You know. I can't explain it to you. I can't, I, I can't give you, well, if you did this, 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 and this, well, then you're saved. No, no. It's what's on the inside of you. know down on the inside of you if you met Jesus Christ. Because if you did meet Jesus Christ, something changed on the inside of you. Hello? Now, we all have different testimonies, and we have some of us have more dramatic testimonies than others of how God delivered us or how God, you know, worked in our lives or something, and that's not really the point, because you could have, you could have been the best person. You could have been the nicest guy. You could have been the person that everybody loved to be around. You could have just been Mr. Jollies, and then still be headed to hell because you never believed Jesus Christ was the Lord of your life. And so if you get saved and Jesus comes into your life, well, you may not see as drastic of a change in your life as you did in, you know, my life or somebody else's life that made a drastic change. You were a drug addict and now you're not. You were an alcoholic and now you're not. But that doesn't change the fact that you know down on the inside of you, you know that you know that you know. Hello? That Jesus has touched your life. You know that you can stand before the throne of God and, you know, you know you didn't do everything right, but you know you're in heaven. See, folks, I'm not real worried about getting to heaven and having rewards or how big my mansion is. I just want to get in the door. Right? I'll slide down over the streets of gold and just sit by the back wall. I don't care. I'm in heaven. I know I'm going to heaven. Hello? I know Jesus is the Lord and Savior of my life. We all have to get to that place. That day that that happened to you, whatever happened to you, whether it was in the middle of a, a horrible situation of your life, you were at the bottom of, of, of the world and you cried out to Jesus and said, Jesus, I want you to be the Lord and Savior of my life, whatever happened, or if it was a, a sitting in a, in a church you were raised in and all of a sudden one day you realized that you needed Jesus and you called out on him. However it happened, that day the move of God started in your life. Hello? 
That day is when the move of God started in your life. You're not going to get into a bigger move of God than the day you got saved. Hello? You're going to find new experiences with, 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 with Jesus. You're going to find new th things that you see that in the Word. You're going to find new, new experiences and new th all this kind of stuff. But the move of God started that day. Hello? You came alive to the things of God. Your sins were forgiven. Heaven was open to you. The wall of separation was torn down between you and Jesus, or you and the Father. Jesus tore it down, and, and all of a sudden, man, you were able to walk into heaven and say, hey, Daddy, now that's, a pretty big, that's a pretty big move. Are y'all with me? That move of God that started that day is the same move of God that's going to continue through your whole life, and that that happened to you that day is the same way you walk through every other thing in life. Every other trial, every other tribulation, every other pain, every other joy. You know, a lot of times we talk about the pains of life, but, you know, I'm talking about also the joys of life and you're rejoicing. It's great to see God do things in your life. Amen? Okay, so um, I talked about this. I talked about being in the dispensation of grace. I talked about different things last week about the, what it means for the, the age of grace we live in, I, I went over all that, so you can go back and you can listen to last week's message if you didn't get all that, because if I, you know how long-winded I am, if I go back, we'll never get anywhere. So I want to go to, go to, the, to uh, Matthew 25 this morning, Matthew 25, and I started talking about last week that the moment that the move of God started in your life, you became a disciple. Now, a disciple is not a word we use all the time, and you know it's usually used in a religious context. You don't call your your employees disciples, but a disciple is a learner, a follower. If you're a, a if you're a follower of Jesus Christ and you're learning, you are a disciple. Okay, you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, and so. Jesus, we talked about last week in Matthew 28 that he told us that we're supposed to go into the world and make disciples. You're supposed to duplicate yourself. You're supposed to be making disciples. Now, I heard a guy say this the other day. I thought it was pretty funny. He says, yeah, it's required of every, every man that he has to make two disciples. And I said, and I, I thought to myself, where, where, do you, where do you get that scripture? And he says, well, he says, go into all the world and make disciples. And so it's plural, so it has to be at least two. So I'm like, got a good point there, buddy. It's got to be two. So I think every one of us are required to make two disciples, okay? That may be your two children, all right? Because you got to understand something, folks, and I'm going to get into some of this today, is sometimes we forget we're looking out, you know, we're looking out into the world thinking, oh, gosh, I've got to go to Ethiopia. I've got to go to here. I've got to go to there. That's what God's called me if I'm really going to be a disciple. But you got to remember it's what's right around you. Your children, your grandchildren, those people that are right around you, those are the ones that, that you've got to be looking at in order to minister to, in order to, you know, make disciples, okay? So anyway, in Matthew chapter 25, verse 1, it says, Then the kingdom of God shall be like unto ten virgins. Now, I want you just to, for a moment, just remove the kingdom of God and put the, a move of God. Then the move of God should be like ten virgins who took their lamp and they went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. And those that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels and their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and they trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for your lamps are going out. But the wise answered and said, you should have brought some more yourself. He says, no, at least there should be enough of us that they should gather, go to, the, and, and to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went out to buy, the, the bridegroom came, and those that were ready went in into a wedding, and the door was shut. And afterwards, other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And he answered and said, surely I say unto you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you do not know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. 
Okay, do you notice at the very first that he said the kingdom of God is like an unto? But I notice that you can go through the Bible and you can change every word says the kingdom of God and you can put in there a move of God. In other words, the move of God's like 10 virgins. In other words, a move of God started in your life, came into your life, and then you were like the guy collecting oil, waiting. See, y'all are here this morning. You better be here this morning because if something stirred you and you were hungry to come to church, that would be the reason to come to church this morning, to want to be in fellowship with God. If you just came to church today to try to get a gold star, you're not getting one. I don't like gold stars. I, have a, I, have a, I need to go to freedom prayer and be delivered from gold star uh, mentality because, you know, when I was in kindergarten, they, you know, you, this is where they started the gold stars and put their name up there. I never had any gold stars. And in and, and first grade, uh, you know, I maybe got one. I just, I just I was not a gold star achiever. And so it always hurt my heart when I looked up at the board and I didn't get any gold stars. And I just wanted to buy gold stars and stick gold stars up there, you know. So I don't like gold stars. I don't like that concept. I don't like the pressure of gold stars. OK. And so if you were trying to get one this morning by coming to church, it doesn't work. You didn't get one. OK. You should have come to church this morning. Because there's something on the inside of you, like one of the ten virgins crying out, saying, I want to be with my Savior. Something's real. Folks, Christianity has been going on the face of the earth for 2,000 years, and and there's people that that have walked, lived, and died, and never experienced the, the, the power of God in their lives. And that's wrong. This Jesus is real. This, this move of God in your life, it's real. It's something that God, that it is, that there's, woo, there's no words to describe. What God can do for you and will do for you. But most people live like this. I was giving my wife this example the other day. And I said, I said, look, it's like this. This is what the Lord's been explaining to me. Now, if I was to, if I was to have a credit card here in my hand and I said, look, this credit card, there's no limit on it. And I want to give you this credit card and you use it for whatever you need. And I gave it to you. And you could just go cha-ching, cha-ching. But what would would you do with it? Would you look at Robert and say, well, you know, Pastor, he's a nice guy, but I mean, you know, okay, well, we'll buy a meal. Uh, I could need some... Need some help getting to church and get some gas. I'll use it for a tank of gas. I mean, would you would you go call Grant and say, "Hey, Grant, listen, I need to buy some real estate. I got a credit card here. It's got no limit on there. I've always wanted a thousand acre ranch." Would you not even? I don't know how you would be, but you would probably say, "Well, I don't know that Robert has the wherewithal." To spend a million dollars and on this credit card, they said it was no limit, but I mean, oh, come on, it's just Robert, right? But then let's say a wealthier individual gave you a credit card. Let's say that man's worth was worth $100 million, and he gave you this credit card and said, here, this credit card's yours, use it. What would you do then? Would you... Would you feel, oh, I just don't feel right. I'd like a new car, but I just don't really think I should use this credit card on a new car. You know, again, you maybe bought two tanks of gas. All right, you follow what I'm saying? You start to put a limit on what the credit card is. And when the man tells you that there's no limit on it, you start to put a limit on it because you begin to rationalize in your mind what would that be worth? or what, What does he really mean? The Bible says when you got saved, well, the Bible didn't say it gave you a credit card because they didn't have a credit card then. But the Bible says that you were blessed with exceedingly great and precious promises. And that everything that pertains into this life, there was a promise tied to it, and it was yours. And the promise is yes. Are you with me? So God Almighty gives you a credit card and says, I'm giving you this credit card and you can do whatever you want to with it. And we say, well, I mean, thank you, Lord. I appreciate that. And we use it for this and we use it for this small amount, but we would never use it for a big amount because you in your head 
talk yourself out of that by faith, you deserve it. So you start putting limits on God. You start putting limits on what God can do for you. You start putting limits on that God would heal you. You start putting God limits on God that he would want you to be blessed and, you know, have a better house or, or, or whatever you need. You, you get the scripture that your clothes don't wear out for 40 years and you're still believing God that your, 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 your old clothes aren't going to wear out. And you just keep saying, oh, God's going to bless me and he's just going to make these old clothes wear, not wear out. When I would grab the scripture and say, well, they fought for Jesus's clothes at the foot of the cross. If Jesus was a beggar and he wasn't worth anything and his clothes were rags, why would they be fighting for his clothes at the foot of the cross if they were worthless? Are y'all with me? Now, I'm not much of a clothes. I don't need to use clothes that's, I'm, I'm, that I don't have much of a good example on that. I mean, you know. A cinch shirt's about the best I ever get, you know, and so I don't know anything else out there. I don't need an Armani suit. I wouldn't know an Armani suit from a J.C. Penney suit. It, I might, I guess. I guess I have a good enough eye to know that, but I wouldn't want either one. <laughs> Can a hats? That'd be different, but anyway. <laughs> but do you follow what I'm saying? You were born again and a move of God came in your life and Jesus said, I'll give you everything that you need that pertains to life and godliness. I'll give it to you. He gave you a credit card. He said, everything that life and godliness pertains to you, just what you need, everything you need, it's right here. But yet then we don't use it because we put limits on what we think God will do for us based upon our works. When the whole thing, the whole getting saved principle is not based upon works, it's based upon faith. And your faith and your belief in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So what we do is, the virgins here in this story, part of those virgins said, man, we're going to take extra oil. They were prepared. The other ones cut it short, ran out of oil. I don't know about you, but I'm going to live my life for Jesus with extra I want to have enough in life to be a blessing to others. Let's read another story here. Going down to verse 14. Still Matthew 25, verse 14. It says, the kingdom of God, or the kingdom of heaven is like a man. Okay, let's change it. Um, the move of God is like a man traveling into a far country, called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents. To another he gave two, and to another to of his own, according to his own ability, and immediately went on a journey. And there he received, then he who received the five talents went. Now went would go along with go, right? When Jesus said go into the world, went would be like, same thing. And he went and he traded with them and made another five talents. Let's just say he made another five disciples. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also, made two more disciples. But he had received one, went and he dug into the ground and hid the Lord's money. And after a long time, the Lord of those servants came and he settled accounts with them. So he had received five talents and brought five talents, saying, Lord, I delivered to, you, to me five talents. So look, I've gained five more talents beside these. And he said unto him, well done, the good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things, and I want to make you ruler over many things. So here's this guy that was so excited about his salvation that he went and he gained, he, he went and he got five more people so, saved. He made five disciples. And then when the Lord came back, he said, look, Lord, whoo, you did so much good for me, man. I got five more here. And he said, where to go? I'll make you charge of five cities. So then the story goes on, it says, and then he had two, came, and he said, look, Lord, I made two more. He said, man, I was so excited about my life. I, I told everybody about Jesus. I, look, I got two disciples, brought them to heaven, gave them to the Lord. Lord said, where to go? You'd be in charge of two cities. The other one that only had one. He said, Lord, look, I, I was scared. I didn't know what to do. I know you're an austere man, I, and, and, and you, 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 I was scared to go do anything. So I didn't do nothing. Listen to me, folks. I remember getting started in my walk with Jesus. I was so afraid to tell people about what Jesus had done for me because I didn't know what kind of reaction I was going to get. 
And so I got held back in life, kind of, you know, like I was like, oh, man, you know. And then one day I realized something. Ugly people are ugly. And they're going to do ugly things no matter what you say. Whether you believe that a Chevy's the best or a Ford's the best, or you believe Jesus is the best, they're going to have something critical to say. But anyway, because ugly people do ugly things. And so I realized it didn't really make any difference. And everybody knew I was crazy anyway. And so then that's when I started really praying for people and sharing with people and trying to get people to come to church and do things because I knew that Jesus changed my life. And if Jesus changed my life, well, then he'd change somebody else's life. And that if my eyes were open and he could help me, then surely he would help them. And so I just began to say, look, this is, I got help over here. All of y'all, y'all are good people. I know you guys, you're good people. And if you found something that was working, how many of you in here, you found something, you started taking I don't know what. You found a new vitamin, a new energy drink, a new baking powder, a new, new, new recipe, a new, new, new flour that was better than the other flour, and you shared that with somebody else. Oh, my, I, the other day I found the greatest stuff. Have y'all all done that? Give me a show of hands here. If you've done that, okay. You found, I found the greatest stuff. Oh, I found the greatest seasoning. Oh, I found the greatest this. Oh, it was so good, you know, and you told your friend about it. Hello? Or you told your family members about it. You told somebody about it because you found something great, and then you went and shared it with them. Well, I tell you, I found something really great. His name is Jesus Christ. And he's changed my life. And he's changed my family. He's blessed me. And he gives me peace, and he gives me grace, and he gives me mercy. And so when I find somebody that's down in the dumps, I tell them about Jesus. I said, let's pray. Let me talk. Jesus can change this. I give them a scripture. I give them something because it's just like that. I have found the treasure. Over in the other, uh, in, in, in Matthew, it says, and, and the, the, remember the pearl of great price? It says a man found it. It says the kingdom of heaven is if, the move of God is if, you found a great pearl. And he went and sold all and bought it. The kingdom of heaven, the move of God is if in your life, you've excited about what happened and you got the talent and you got five more talents or you got two and you got two more. Not hit it in the ground. I don't have anything to be ashamed of. In this world today, everybody wants to talk about this, that, and the other, and argue about this, that, and the other, and about, about this, this marriage and that and the other. And I just always say, man, what does the Bible say? I believe in the Bible. I believe the Bible is true. End of story. I mean, I don't know what else to tell you. I believe my Bible is true. Go read it. If you don't want to read it, go listen to it. If you don't want to listen to it, shut up. Don't make your decisions based upon something you don't know. It amazes me how many people want to tell me what they think the Bible says, but they've never read the Bible. You know, go read it. Well, I tried to read it. Didn't understand it. Obviously. <laughs> All right. The point is, that's what it means to be making disciples is you're excited about what happened to you, so you're telling somebody else about it. That's all it is, folks. The gospel is simple. It's not complicated. But let me tell you something. If it doesn't mean anything to you, and you're not excited about it, then I question you really, really ever met Jesus. You may say, oh, can't believe you said that. I did. I threw it right out there in your face. Because I'm telling you, you cannot meet the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You cannot meet Jesus and not be changed. You cannot meet Jesus. You, you cannot meet Jesus and not be impressed. I look around at y'all and, and I, I, I'm so blessed. I'm so blessed as a pastor because... I, I got, you know, I got rowdies in here and I look around at y'all and I see, oh man, I know them, you know, and I know your testimony, I know what happened, I know this and that and the other, you know. What did you tell me, Brian, that they had 1% chance of living? Is that what you said? 1%. That's a pretty bad report when the doctor gives you 1% chance to live. <laughs> I mean, that's just like, I mean, how can, it can't get worse. I mean, what is it because I give you a half a percent chance? 
I mean, he might as well have not even said anything. But he sits here today because Jesus is such his life. If you see what I'm saying? I look around at y'all rowdies and I look at you and I know things have happened to your life. And I know that you know what I'm talking about this morning because you came from darkness into light. You made a big step. Hello? Got an atheist sitting over there. Hello? A, a former atheist sitting over there. Yes, all those of you out there, we all know who he is. Former atheist sitting over there. Thank you for that correction. That's a big one. Hello? But Jesus touched his life. You see, that move of God that got started then is the move of God that keeps propelling you throughout your whole life and then causes you to want to share it with somebody else. And that process is simply called making a disciple. I've noticed all you you, you, you group of young lakey people. Y'all are all growing. I love it. You're making disciples. There's just more of you every week. Glory to God. You see, that's what's got to take place. Something happened on the inside of you. It's not me. It's not Robert. It's Jesus. Something happened on all of us that makes us just want to be with him, and then that gets off on other people, and that's called the gospel principle process happening. It's not a denomination. It's the kingdom principle. And this world right now wants to tell you to shut up, and I'm telling you, you need, to, you need to get louder. The world right now keeps trying to tell you, oh, you know, oh, 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 oh. No, we need to get louder. We got the answer. I know we got the answer because it happened, it worked, and changed my life. Hello? That's what this is ta- I'm trying to get across to you this morning. That's the simplicity of the gospel. Exactly what y'all are doing is what calls making disciples, and that in turn, leads to other people making cities, making cities, making cities, making cities, and winning more people and winning more people. Amen? Okay. So, let's keep going down Matthew 25. Go to 31. 31 says... It's the story where Jesus said, you've done to at least one of these, and my brother, and you've done unto me. Okay? And I'm just giving you these references. I'm just going to tell you what it says because I don't want to read it all. So, you know, he says he's got his sheep and his goats. You want to be a sheep. You don't want to be a goat. And he goes through and he says, you know, you, why are we getting into heaven? He says, We're, you, you know, you gave me food when I was hungry. You gave me this and that and the other. And he says, when did we do this? He said, if you've done unto the least one of these, my brother, and you've done it unto me. Well, listen, folks, I don't. I'm excited about what happened to me. I'm excited about Jesus. And what I'm trying to introduce people to is Jesus, right? Not Robert. I'm trying to introduce them to Jesus. But then on the other side of that, I'm doing that because Jesus blessed me. And you got to understand, every time you're making a disciple, you're telling somebody about Jesus, he's blessed. Do you hear what I'm saying? He said, you've done the least one of these, my brother, and you did it unto me. What you're doing, you're doing, it's got a twofold to it. One is the person's coming to know Jesus, but the second thing is you're doing it to Jesus. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So when you're making a disciple and you're telling somebody about Jesus, or you're praying for somebody, you're encouraging them, you're strengthening them, you're doing it, you're do, it's just, yes, yes. You're helping them, but then also you're doing it to Jesus. And I'm very thankful to Jesus that he didn't leave me in the pig pen of life. Hello? Okay, another important scripture, Acts 1.8. Acts 1 and 8. It says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Okay, you're going to be a witnesses in three places, Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. Where's Jerusalem? That's your hometown. Where's Judea? That's your state. Where's Samaria? It's the world around you. The first place you start making disciples is what's around you. Who's around you? 
Well, most of the time it's your family. You say, well, my family won't listen to me. Well, then go outside the family. Go to Judea. Who's your friends around you? Who's your neighbors? Well, I don't have any neighbors. Well, you don't have any neighbors because you're not friendly? Because the Bible says that he who has friends must show himself friendly, so you can't get friends if you're not friendly. If every time somebody comes up to your house, you shoot at them. <laughs> then, you know, you're going to have a hard time having neighbors. Right? The coffee shop. The restaurant, the service person that comes to work on something in your house, the people that are around you, who you run in contact with. Listen, unless, see, I always use this example about Ethiopia because when I first got saved and I knew God called me to preach, I didn't want to accept the call because I felt, I just knew he was going to send me to Ethiopia. And the reason why I thought Ethiopia was because they kept showing, I kept watching uh, Christian television, and they kept showing these, these, you know, like help the children, feed the children or whatever uh, deals, and they were showing these horrible scenes of these horrible children with flies all on them in Ethiopia. And I just like, oh, God, that's terrible. Uh, you know, I'm gonna, you're going to send me there, aren't you? If I say yes, I'm going to, next thing I know, I'm going to be in Ethiopia. And, you know, I joke about this with Pastor Charles because he's over in Ethiopia all the time, you know, so I joke about it with him. But I just knew I was going to get sent to Ethiopia. I just knew it. And then finally I could not stay anymore. Just one night I walked out into the stars and were shining, and I walked outside my house, and I said, okay, if this is what I got to do, I got to do it. If I got to go to Ethiopia, I'll go to Ethiopia. <laughs> and then the Lord just spoke to me so quietly. He says, why would I send you to Ethiopia? You don't know anything. And I'm like, that's right. I just got saved. I don't know nothing. <laughs> why would I go to Ethiopia? What do I, who am I going to teach anything? I don't know nothing. I hadn't even read the Bible yet. So why would I? You're going to send me? I ain't going to be the great missionary to Ethiopia. I don't know nothing. And then it was shortly thereafter, I ended up in Utopia, <laughs> which is close to Ethiopia. <laughs> so... You get all worried about, you know, what's going to happen, this, that, and the other, but it's who's around you? My goodness, who's around you? Well, your family, your children. My son is a little boy. You can go ask him. This is truth. We'd, every evening, we got laid down on the bed. He was little. He couldn't even read, but I was showing him how to read his Bible. And I would get him, and I'd open up my Bible, and I would read to him in my Bible. And I'd go down there, and I'd read to him. And I'd say, this is the way you read your Bible. When he first could start to learn to write, I got him to writing scriptures down, making a Raymond notebook. I said, here, you need to write these scriptures down. I gave him some scriptures, told him to write them down in his little book. I discipled him, discipled my daughter. I took her, she, she, you know, and, and, and discipled her and put these things in her and, you know, all these different things. Because you've got to do it with those that are around you. That's how you make disciples. You just simply share with those around you what's going on inside of you. That's really all there is. And if you're excited and on a good path with Jesus, well, then it's going to be a natural, a natural thing. Now, I told you all, I, I don't know if I told you or not, but I should have. <clears throat> Last, I guess it's been a week ago, I went to a, 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 a church conference where they were doing a deal on discipleship making. And I got stirred up about this. At first, I was depressed, I'll be honest with you. First, I was ready to throw in the towel, say, we ain't done nothing. We're terrible. I'm a horrible pastor. I should quit. I should do the church a favor and quit. This is what I felt like. And then after a while, I started listening to what these guys were saying. I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. We're not using the same terminology here. Because what's happening on the face of the earth right now, and they were showing all the statistics of this, that, that, that church growth is, is going wild. But then when I realized what they were calling church, I realized that meant that there was a group of believers that had gotten together and were sharing the word. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. If that's the definition of church, then we got like 15 started. It's like this church and 15. Because we just call them prayer meetings or, you know, fellowships or 
come drink coffee or whatever. And I'm like, wait a minute, if, we're, if that's the definition of church, so that got me to start to thinking and start to doing my own digging about church and what is church. So <clears throat> I want to read this to you. It says, go to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. It says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Okay, he's not talking about marriage at that deal. He's saying, Jesus loves the church like a husband should love his wife. And Jesus, so let's just stop for a minute. Jesus, and everybody say, Jesus loves the church. Okay. So the word church, what we usually, when you say church, you usually think about a building. Is that not right? If you say we're going to go to church, immediately you think about a building. You think about however in your mind you think about a building. But the word church in the actual definition, is ecclesia, okay? It means a calling out, a calling out, okay? Also, a popular meeting, especially a religious congregation, a synagogue or a Christian community of members on earth or saints in heaven, an assembly, the church. But when I read that, the calling out, it just hit me, the calling out. Now, it, it means, so think about this. It, 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 when, in that deal, it means like somebody standing there saying, hey, we're having a meeting here in town. Come on out to the square. And everybody came out of their house to come to the meeting. Y'all follow me? That's the calling out means. But it also can mean the calling out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. It can mean the calling of coming out of your unsafe life to your safe life. It means that you were somewhere and you were called out, so therefore you're assembling in a place because of the experience or the move of God that happened in your life. You now are doing something different. So when it says Jesus loves the church, it means he loves those that are called out to him. Are you following me? He loves those that are, have been called out and drawn away from darkness and come to him. He loves them. Look at the person beside you and say, Jesus loves you. And then look back at him again and say, now he really loves me. Just listen to me this morning. Right now, you got to understand something. Jesus is smiling at you because you're here this morning. Jesus loves you. Now, my wife loves me. She tells me, and then she shows me. Y'all follow me? That's just my wife. Now, wait a minute. Jesus loves me? He loves me because I've been, I accepted him and I'm called out, and he loves me? And he's giving me the example of, of my relationship with my wife and saying, oh, I love the church, the called out ones, the ones that assemble to me. I love them. I love them like a husband loves his wife. I'd do anything for my wife. So wait a minute, Jesus is saying he'd do anything for you? He'd give you a credit card in the limit? If my wife is sick, I want to make her feel better. 
Hear what I'm saying to you this morning, church. We got to wake up. We got to get our, we got to get, uh, uh, Dr. Brown's been uh, uh, talking to me about neurons in your head. And hey, we got to get some neurons firing off in your head, bringing about the reality of this salvation that's yours. It is not, you did not join church. That's why I refuse to have a membership in this church. You can't join this church. We don't have membership. You come tell me, oh, I'm a part of Living Word Church. Hey, hey, got you back. But I ain't going to give you no letter. I'm not going to give you no certificate from Living Waters Church that you can go tell around and say, oh, I'm a member of Living Waters Church. Man, you got to be a member because you're saved, born again, love Jesus. Dear Lord, it's got to be something real on the inside of you. I'm not going to be passing out letters. Might give some of you a D. Are you following me? If I passed out letters, y'all would be going around checking. <laughs> How come you got an A plus? No, you know what I'm talking about. It's the assembling together. Now, wait, 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 wait. Go look at Matthew chapter 18, verse 19. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. How many of them? Now, what does this one say? Is that right? What was that? Two, right? Two of you agree? Right? Go to the next verse. Now, where two or three? Two or three? It's more than one, right? Two or three are gathered together in my name. I'm there in the midst. When the ecclesia, more than two or three, so I guess you can't have church with one, unless you want to consider the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. But you follow what I'm saying? The assembly of what he's talking about here in this scripture, he's not talking about one person. He's talking about you gathering with other ones that are called out. Come on. We take this lightly. Is this true or not? Isn't it funny how you can say, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you'll be saved. Everybody says, okay, that's what I got to do. I don't want to go to hell. But if I say, if two of you get together in his name, Jesus is there and they met you, you're like, yeah. It's a nice thought. It's a euphoric thought. Wait a minute. Is Jesus in here this morning? Do we act like it? I'm just saying to you, I'm not trying to convict anybody. I mean, the Holy Ghost can do that. I'm not trying to be, I'm just saying, we got to get hold of a reality. A reality that Jesus is in our midst. The King of Kings, the Son of God is in our midst right now. Just like the air in this room. And when we have an issue or we have a problem, we have something that we need, he's given us the credit card and it's time to draw on it. It's time to draw by faith on the things of God. It's time to quit playing church and be church. It's time to start getting excited again. Some of us older ones that have been saved for a while, you may have gotten a little rusty. And it's time to get some WD-40 out and get some sandpaper and get it all cleaned off and get yourself shining again. And that Jesus is real. You say, oh, yeah. Folks, listen to me. I, have a, I kept a journal. There was a time and period when everybody was really talking about journaling and how important journaling was, and so I started, tried to journal. But I don't write well. I mean, I don't write well, and I don't know how to type. And so it's, I have a, a, a problem with writing because I fought dyslexia most of my life, and so I change everything around, turn everything around with B's and B's and everything just all crazy. So it's real hard for me. So, so I, I, I quit writing in this journal because I couldn't read it. <laughs> so every now and then I pull this journal out and I go back and I start deciphering it. I start looking at it and, and reading my, you know, my pig Latin that I've written down here and try to figure out what it says. And I start laughing because what's so funny about it is the things I was in, in turmoil about believing God for. And then I look at it today and I'm like, that's nothing, Robert. You were just all up in arms, wringing your hands, thinking the world was coming to an end. And it was really, it was a small thing. It was a little thing. And then 
the things that, that I'm walking through now, and I'm saying, wow, Lord, look, look what you're doing, because there's growth. It blesses me because I realize there's growth in all of that, okay? But what I'm trying to say to you is we got to get to the point to where we're starting to believe and really by faith grab hold of this thing and wanting to get together with other believers so that we can see Jesus in our midst doing miracles. But the problem is, we haven't, we've let discouragement and despair come in. We haven't operated in the, in the principles of the kingdom of God, right? We haven't, we haven't done the, the things that are right. We hadn't walked in it right, and so therefore we've been discouraged. We think, oh, it doesn't really mean anything. Really? Then why am I looking at y'all smiling faces? Because Jesus is doing a work in y'all. And that work's worth needs to be shared. And that's called making disciples. And that's called having church. So when you gather with your friends and you're drinking some coffee and you're discussing the scriptures, you're having church. When you go over to your neighbor's house and you're praying for them, and you, don't, you got to understand something. Technically, you're having church because Jesus is in the midst of you. When I first started looking at this, I got kind of nervous, and I said, Lord, if I preach something like this, well, then I'm just throwing open the door to chaos. This is what I told the Lord. And he took me to a scripture. I want to show you this. Go to the book of Acts chapter 20, and I'm closing here. Acts 20. He showed me something about this. In Acts chapter 20, Paul is leaving, and, and, and he's not going to see the church at Ephesus again, and he's talking to the Ephesian elders around there and all, and he says to them that, verse 29, for I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. The Apostle Paul spent three years at Ephesus building up a church there, a body of believers, an assembly. He built them up for three years, and then he's going on to Jerusalem. He knows what's going to happen to him, and he says, by the way, I just want to tell y'all, I'm departing from here, and when I do, savage wolves are going to come in. They're not going to spare the flock. They're going to devour people and try to draw people unto themselves rather than unto Jesus. They're going to draw people unto themselves unto Jesus but I just want you to know, listen to what he says. I just want you to know that I'm going to commend you to God and to the word of his grace. In other words, he says, God's able to take care of it. You're going to lose a few, but God's able to take care of it. He's going to make sure that the word of God goes on, the disciples are all taken care of, and everything's going to be okay. You see, at first when you start thinking about church being just a small groups of believers, the first thing I think about is, oh my gosh, what are they going to be teaching each other? Each other's bad habits? But I believe God is making a move today on the face of the earth that what he's trying to do is, yes, he wants us to assemble here on Sunday morning and come together and hear a the teaching and have fellowship with one another and be able to have testimonies of what, what God's doing in our midst and hear the things that are going on and stay in charge. But I believe all through the week, we're supposed to be meeting with other people and we're supposed to be create, creating more churches. And churches take it out of your mind, buildings, and put in your mind fellowship with believers. Where you sit around, and you share the word of God. 
and you get Jesus in your midst so that Jesus can take care of what he loves. And heaven help the one who gets in his way. Because what I see in here is whoever those people were that came in that were the ravenous wolves, oh, how great was the judgment upon them. Whoever, I, whoever it was that came into that church and said, oh, let's sort off some of the people and we get them over here looking at us. Those people, man, whoo I wouldn't want to have been in their shoes when they met Jesus. Put it this way. You love your family and you'd do anything for them, right? Now that's earthly love. You don't think Jesus will step into the middle of a situation of going on with people that he loved, his body, and smack somebody around? You say, oh, Jesus, he doesn't smack. I wouldn't want to push it. I wouldn't want to push it. So what I'm encouraging and what I want to leave you with right now is simply this. Church, start getting hold of the reality of Jesus in your midst. Start making an effort. Two or more together. That you start acknowledging Jesus in your midst. Start when you get together with two or more, you get your Bible out, and you look at a scripture. Now, I've got a whole bunch of other things I'm going to go through. I'm not through with this message, but start becoming aware. What's going to ignite it is you getting turned on to what happened to you and you sharing it with someone else. The move of God that started in you, you sharing that with somebody else. and making a disciple. Now, have you, you don't need to show your hands or anything, I'm just going to throw this up there. Have you ever in here, anybody in here, have you ever just encouraged somebody about Jesus? No, I want to see a show of hands. If you've ever encouraged somebody about Jesus, let me see your hands. Well then, you know what? You were on the disciple-making path. You were on the disciple-making path. Listen, have you ever sat down with somebody and read the Bible? Lift your hands. At least me on Sunday morning, right? (laughs) The point I'm trying to say to you, folks, that's what it is. That's disciple-making. There's nothing cooler in this world than to see Jesus answer a prayer for somebody else. There's nothing cooler that I enjoy more in life when someone calls me up and says, hey, pastor, going through a situation, going through a problem, uh, can you pray for me or whatever like this? And then we talk about it. We can share the word. We pray over it. And then, I, I, and then they come back and tell me, hey, man, God did it. I love to hear that. I love to hear that. There's nothing to me more exciting in life than that. So I encourage you. Start grabbing hold of it that you are disciple makers. Start grabbing hold of it right now that you got a move of God in your life. Look at the person beside you and say, I got a move of God going on in my life. Amen. Stand to your feet. If you're out there listening to the broadcast this morning, wherever you are, I want you to know Jesus loves you. No matter where you are, or what you've done, Jesus loves you, he cares about you. If you're in here this morning, you know, I've been talking about salvation all morning. Matter of fact, let me have my prayer team come up, please. But if you're out there listening on the broadcast, man, I encourage you to stop what you're doing right now. And if you don't know that you know that you know that Jesus Christ is the Lord and Savior of your life, that right now you begin to call out on him and say, Jesus, come into my life. I I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. I believe your blood washes and cleanses me of my sins and makes me right with you. Come into my life, Jesus.
And right there, wherever you are, he'll touch your heart. If you're in here today and this message has prop- prompted you, you're not really sure, you, you, you think you're saved, you, you thought you were, but now you're, you're beginning to say, I don't know, you're getting talked out of it. Well, listen, if the devil can talk you out of it, you probably aren't. Hello? So we got prayer team up here this morning. And if you, you, you want to get, you want to make sure that you're right with Jesus, you want to make sure that you're right, your sins are forgiven, you're headed to heaven, well, then we got a prayer teams up here. We'll pray for you this morning. We'll encourage you. We'll show you what the Word of God says. It's that simple. Don't leave this building. Don't let pressure get upon you and you leave this building. I heard Billy Graham say this the other day, so Billy Graham said it's the truth. He said that a person ought to be willing to walk to the front and give their life to Jesus if he was willing to walk to the cross and give his life for you. So I believe that with all of my heart. I'm not going to put the pressure on it, put you, put you, no, 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 no. Here we are. Don't leave this building. Come to the front. Make Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life. Amen? Now, I want you to grab that person's hand beside you, and I'm going to pray over you. And I want to ask you right now to just make yourself aware of Jesus in your midst. And all this week, so be observant to all those around you and making Jesus Lord and Savior in your midst. And so, Father, right now, I just pray in Jesus' name over every person in here, over all those out there watching and listening on the broadcast, I just declare right now, Lord, that you are so aware, that we are so aware of you in our midst all this week, that when we assemble ourselves and come together with one another and share your word and pray together, that, Jesus, you are there in our midst because you love the church. And so I ask you to put your hand upon each and every one of us. Put your hand upon our lives. Bless them, Lord God. Give us divine appointments this week. People to come across our path that we will know that they need to be introduced to you. And so, Lord, I thank you for it. I praise you for it. Lord, bless them now as they go. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. God bless you, church. Go have church this week.